It's now 2 o'clock. We will start. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar entitled Discussing Public Health Roles in Population Mental Health and Wellness Promotion. My name is Milen, and I will provide technical support for this webinar. Just to let you know that for the audio, we will only use the teleconference line. Please, if it's not already done, uh, dial in the teleconference number that are on the screen. At any time during the webinar, you can write your questions uh, in the chat box. And uh, please note that the PowerPoint presentation as well as the, web as the recording of the webinar will be available afterwards on our website, and we will send you an email with the link. Thank you, and I will now pass the microphone to my colleague, Pascal Mantoura. Thank you, Milan. I'm trying to shift slides. OK, thank you very much, Milan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Pascal Mantoura. I'm scientific advisor at the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policy. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to welcome today uh, Shanna Kalix and Dr. Penny Sutcliffe, as well, from uh, Public Health Sudbury and District. Uh, we'll be sharing the presentation time today, so I'll first be presenting some of the roles for public health, uh, for population mental health and wellness promotion as they emerge from a forum I'll be discussing with you shortly. And next, um, um, the team from Public Health, Sudbury and Districts will be discussing how they, they've integrated a public mental health perspective into their public health programming. So first, let's see some elements of the, the context of today's uh, webinar. So as Milan said, uh, the session is being recorded. Um, the, uh, there are no conflicts of interest to declare in terms of the planning committee of this webinar. Uh, there are no conflicts of interest to declare in terms of all three presenters of today's presentation. Um, the slides have been reviewed by the chair of the scientific planning committee. And if you are a public health physician, you can have access to continuing education credits. So if you've registered and attended the session, you will receive a certificate uh, within the next two weeks. And if you didn't register, please make sure you complete the post-event survey to request a certificate. So some context on this series again. Uh, of course, the webinar, uh, the primary audience is really uh, intended for, uh, the webinar is really intended as a primary audience uh, for public health physicians or physicians working in relation with the public health. But of course, we are extremely happy to welcome here today the broad public health workforce uh, interested in working um, in connection to population mental health and really interested to, to find out more about what the roles are for public health uh, in this area of work. Uh, so um, in terms of background of the series, uh, there, was, there were a minimum uh, set of competencies that have been identified for medical officers of health. The project was funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. The National Collaborating Center for Public Health uh, collaborate with Public Health Physicians of Canada to really promote this set of competencies through this series of webinars. And it's within this context that the NCCHPP specifically for this webinar uh, is providing in collaboration with Public Health Physicians of Canada uh, this last webinar of the series for 2019 on population mental health and the roles of public health because um, population mental health had been identified as a need in terms of supporting competencies within this context of, of competencies for medical officers of health. Um, so there are six national collaborating centers across con the country. They're financed by the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, they all share a common mandate, which is to uh, provide knowledge exchange activities to support public health actors in a diversified, diversified area of expertise. Um, the NCCHPP has specific expertise in terms of supporting public health uh, in the area of work uh, in linked to public, uh, healthy public policy. We also house the Population Mental Health Project uh, since 2013 and have uh, acted as scientific support on some occasions when all six NCCs have collaborated uh, for Population Mental Health Projects. And so the, the, the forum, which I'll be discussing with you today, is one of those uh, collaborative projects uh, uh, where the, all six NCCs have contributed and collaborated. Um, 
So the, the objectives for today uh, really are to recognize the context and processes that led to the clarification of public health roles for population mental health and mental wellness promotion, uh, to identify some of those roles, and to understand the process of integration of a population mental health perspective in a public health practice setting, which is what uh, the team from Sudbury will be discussing um, in their presentation. So very briefly, looking at some of your answers you provided when you registered, the majority of, of the actors present here today are from uh, Ontario, uh, British Columbia next, uh, New Brunswick, Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Nova Scotia, Quebec, outside of Canada, and Prince Edward Island. You've identified a majority being of an intermediate level of comfort and knowledge when it comes to mental health and wellness promotion. Um, just want to say that today's uh, presentations are really uh, high-level overview in terms of what the roles are um, uh, and how those perspectives are integrated within practices. We are not going to be covering um, elements of theory or approaches when it comes to mental health promotion. So uh, if some of you find that some things are really covered too quickly or too uh, um, uh, in, in a very high-level perspective in terms of what mental health promotion is. I'm really, uh, I would welcome um, any contact through email after the webinar to provide more information or resources if you, if, if you feel necessary. <clears throat> so looking at the types of uh, employment or, or, or work functions you've identified, uh, it's interesting to see that m many of you, most of you, have identified for other areas of work that were not in the categories provided. So I'll let you look at that very quickly. Uh, next, uh, we have in majority, we have nurses, uh, program managers and coordinators, policy analysts and advisors, et cetera. Uh, and physicians are, are, not so, uh, not, do not, are not in majority for today's uh, webinar. Um, so we really have an interesting uh, ensemble of a broad workforce contributing to this area of work and interested by this area of work, which is, which is interesting. Uh, we looked at also uh, some elements you provided in terms of uh, why you were interested by the webinar and, and, and the areas of work you were involved in when it came to linking with, with the topic of today's webinar. Uh, so it was interesting again to see that some of you spoke about general mental health promotion, linking with whole of society approaches, working in terms of life course perspectives or, or addressing some social determinants of health. Uh, many of you are working within mental health promotion with various communities and in various contexts. A lot of you are, are interested uh, in developing a mental health promotion strategy within the context of the Ontario guideline. Uh, uh, and, and so I'll let you look at the rest of the, of the elements of, of, uh, of work uh, that, you've, that you've identified, but very interesting to see the broad perspective in terms of mental health promotion as well as <clears throat> indigenous mental wellness. Uh, and some of you are also linking to vulnerable populations and linking specifically, trying to identify links with mental health uh, within, those, within your action uh, with the vulnerable populations you've identified. <clears throat> so, very, so let's start with the presentation. Um, so looking at some context, why have we come to clarify the roles of public health in this area? Um, so you're probably all familiar with this idea of the shift in paradigm when it comes to how we're considering and approaching mental health. Uh, really, it's the understanding that we now know that we need to uh, focus on upstream interventions when we're thinking of promoting mental health. Focusing only on treatment and preventing illness is insufficient anymore. So we're really moving away from merely uh, concer being concerned by a very um, individual and, and medicalized perspective to, to mental illness, to considering uh, population approaches um, in terms of how we can promote wellness in communities and in populations. Uh, and when we were thinking about promoting wellness and promoting mental health, uh, what, what, what seems to be quite important is the we uh, that you see here on the slide. So this idea of, of togetherness and belonging and social inclusion and quality and quantity of social relationships. So these are the areas that interest us when we're thinking of what it means to uh, focus our, our energies in terms of promoting mental health in communities and populations. So very quickly, just, this is just to show that when we're talking about mental health promotion, we're really talking about 
a universal perspective to promote protective factors for mental health and reduce, reduce risk factors across the life course, of course, with, with an equity perspective. Uh, but importantly, what I want to show here is the idea that mental health promotion really relies on health promotion approaches, perspectives. Uh, so we're really here in a competence enhancement, strength-based perspective focusing on participatory and empowering approaches. So this is really where we are today when we're talking about the roles the public health will be considering. We're in that area of work. So very quickly, these are elements you probably, most of you recognize. So uh, the, the underlying elements, theoretical elements behind the work, so con considering mental health is more than the absence of illness, you probably recognize the dual continuum here uh, by Corey Keyes. Uh, the idea that we're working to, um, towards social determinants of mental health across the life course with an equity perspective. The idea that when we're thinking about how we can uh, promote mental health in populations, we're relying on the Ottawa Charter and all the approaches that, that are associated with the Ottawa Charter. So we are really in socio-ecological perspective and essentially working through uh, participatory and empowering approaches. This is a key element of this area of work. And finally, recognizing that there's no health without mental health, so really building here on the mind-body connection and considering individuals holistically. So it's within this context where we see this momentum and emphasis in favor of population approaches to mental health. We've seen the momentum internationally and nationally, and so public health in that context are really being solicited and involved in terms of de developing work in this area. What we're noticing is that there's a lot of work that's being done by public health, not necessarily at this point all labeled as mental health promotion, and we'll get back to that a bit later on, but there's really a lot of work being done, uh, and uh, clearly within that context of a lot of work being done and public health being solicited to take up responsibility in that area, there, there, were, there, are, there are needs that have been identified uh, to support the workforce, and high uh, high in, in those needs was really the need to clarify the role of public health, what it meant for public health to intervene in that area. So it's within this context, really, that all the NCCs, the six NCCs got together to uh, uh, develop an event, a forum, really with the intention to uh, clarify and discuss the role of public health in this area. Uh, in order to do this, they partnered with four organizations, so the Public Health Agency of Canada, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and the Canadian Mental Health Association. Now, essentially, the forum was really built on a two-eyed seeing perspective, and here the idea was that we were hoping to really inform uh, the roles of public health and discuss the roles of public health, not only through the knowledge and expertise that is present within uh, mental health promotion and positive mental health perspectives, but essentially through the knowledge and expertise that is present within indigenous frameworks for mental wellness. So we were trying to really build on the collective expertise of the, all the actors that were in the room uh, and the various uh, representatives of the multiple indigenous communities that were present with us in terms of the knowledge uh, and expertise uh, in, in, in um, and intervening and using processes and methodologies and worldviews uh, for the promotion of health and mental wellness. Uh, I'm sorry, for the promotion of mental health and mental wellness. So we were building on this combined and collective expertise to really try and inform uh, the roles of public health in this area for the benefit of the entire population. So we essentially asked two questions uh, to uh, the actors that were there. Uh, that those, during those two days. We asked them uh, from the perspective of your own practice setting and geographical context or experience and expertise, what do you think are the key roles, functions, or specific actions public health actors at various levels must play or must implement in order to integrate and mainstream population mental health and wellness promotion work into their practices? We also asked them what was needed in terms of support for the work, in terms of skills and knowledge and values, in terms of policies, policies and implementation structures and in, in terms of science and research. And so uh, the, the flip charts were all um, um, transcribed. There was a qualitative content analysis that was done and uh, matched with relevant competency type frameworks. 
to produce a document that is upcoming uh, will be will be available this year. Uh, and so I'm presenting today some high-level elements of those of, of emerging information that came out of the, the of the forum uh, and and of the document that is in production. So first element I'd like you to notice here when we talk about the roles of public health. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that when you look at those roles, you realize and you recognize that those roles are known. Uh, these are known roles for public health practice. And that's one of the key, uh, I would say, realization or finding. It's really the idea that when we're talking about roles for public health in mental health promotion or mental wellness promotion, we're not talking about entirely new work. We're, we're talking about building on the expertise, that is already present within public health. Uh, we are talking about, we're not talking about reinventing the wheel. We're really building on the knowledge and practices and activities that are already underway in public health. And it's not surprising, surprising given that when you think about mental health promotion, really it's about bringing the work upstream, acting on the social determinants of mental health, reducing inequalities in mental health, developing participatory and empowering work through socio-ecological approaches. So this is really the bread and butter of public health. Uh, so we're a known domain. Now, of course, when it comes to integrating mental health, there are some specificities and nuances, and this is what this is about. So. Um, I would like to notice two elements here. So one is really the idea that we are not talking about entirely new work. We're talking about an integration perspective. So integrating um, a mental health perspective in public health programming at the various levels of public health programs. Um, another element I would like you to notice is the fact that enabling change has come up to be added to all the roles. And this is really to uh, insist on the fact that we are really within a health promotion perspective here. Enabling change is a key competency within health promotion practices. And it's really the idea that through everything that's being done, um, it's, it's really about not only about the outcomes that we're trying to bring about in terms of improving mental health states, but we really want to create the mechanisms and the processes that will favor uh, increased control uh, on the factors that influence mental health in individuals and communities. So we want individuals and communities through the processes to develop capacity and control on the factors that affect their mental health and wellness. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to be discussing two, only two elements today, the co-leading and advocacy and enabling change, as well as some elements of integration in public health. I won't be discussing partnering uh, and uh, the two-way communication that came out of the forum uh, in detail. I just want to mention right away that we, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you all realize this because of the type of work this is about. Um, partnering is, is a, a, a key element of the work. None of this activity can happen without the essential partnerships and collaborations with the, the partners of public health uh, in doing this work. And here we talk about the various uh, intersectoral partners, the actors from the mental health uh, sector, the, the indigenous governance structures and community actors and elders and experts from indigenous uh, communities, uh, the numerous actors from communities and NGOs that public health interacts with uh, are all fundamental partners in doing this this type of work, and this is really uh, a, um, an underlying perspective. And through developing those partnerships, uh, the two-way communication, the not only exchanging information and informing uh, um, partners in terms of mental health and mental uh, health promotion, but also listening and learning from the expertise of the different partners was really very strongly present. So, and these elements are really underlying the entirety of the work. Um, so let's get into the um, aspect of co-leading advocacy and enabling change. When we look at this role, um, two major areas came out of the forum. Two major, I would say, characteristics, really, to, to, to explain what this, this means in terms of co-leading and advocacy and enabling change. One was uh, intentional positive disruptors for shifts and paradigms from mental illness to mental health and wellness. The other one was institutional and moral courage for shifts in structural paradigms. 
So when we look at the first one, uh, really what does that mean? It's really essentially about the role of public health leaders to really um, facilitate and mobilize the various partners in terms of the necessity really to bring the focus upstream, uh, to bring uh, about a shared language and vision for mental health, uh, and to focus the work on the social determinants of health, as well as on, on the needed reduction of social inequalities, uh, because we know of the deep connection between social inequities and mental health and wellness outcomes. So really, it's about that mobilizing facilitation uh, work and advocacy work to bring the focus upstream and the necessity of the work upstream. Um, now, two other areas that were mentioned uh, at the forum, and here it's really with humility that I'm acting as, as spokesperson of, of elements that were shared at the forum. Um, it was identified that public health needed really to create an ethical space, which was discussed as, a, as really a space where dialogue uh, was possible, where public health actors could uh, listen and learn from indigenous worldviews and perspectives vis-a-vis -vis mental wellness, uh, as well as inform public health practices. Uh, and acting as ally meant to also be supportive in terms of the self-determined initiatives uh, for uh, the mental wellness of indigenous communities through the processes of indigenous communities uh, uh, developed through self-determined ways. So really those two areas came out quite strongly in terms of creating those spaces and acting as ally. Um, and finally, uh, it was discussed to really uh, orient our activities uh, and give strategic direction to our work in terms of hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. So. When we, think, when we talk about hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose, these are the four orientations that have been identified by the First Nations Mental Wellness, wellness Continuum Framework. Um, just to give you some context when it comes to mental health promotion and positive mental health, um, when we talk about mental health promotion, we really understand that we consider that mental health is really the output of the interaction between individuals and social contexts and, and societies throughout their life course. Uh, and when we say that, we really clearly understand that most social determinants have an association or a link with mental health outcomes. So it becomes really useful to, to attempt to identify key social determinants of mental health to really help shape uh, an orientation and give an orientation to what, we, what it is that we're trying to do specifically when we want to emphasize action on mental health. Um, so some initiatives have tried to identify those key social determinants for mental health. And when we compare them uh, and look at them, we see that they all, they're all quite, um, uh, they arrive at similar conclusions. And essentially what we see is that what's important for mental health are elements such as social inclusion, um, freedom from discrimination and violence, status or social position because of what they, they bring about in terms of respect and dignity and a, a, a access to essential resources. Uh, another element which is very common is the, the idea of belonging and relatedness and connections um, and having control and having opportunities to contribute and to participate socially. So these are key elements when we're thinking about mental health. So at the forum, it was really uh, consensually um, proposed that uh, hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose could be the, the guiding orientation to guide our, our work in terms of what it means to promote mental health, uh, to create hope and belonging and meaning and purpose. So once all this is said, uh, without getting into too much detail here, um, it, it was clear that we needed to have supportive structures and processes and a workforce to really uh, support that type of work. Um, the first element of structure I want to identify that was mentioned is really uh, the most evident one is having legitimacy and a mandate uh, and, and um, to, to do that type, that type of work um, and accountability structures. But more importantly, when we link to what I've just identified, we're talking about having inclusive power sharing, participatory structures and processes, um, and a workforce that is supported not only in terms of mental health and mental wellness literacy, but also in terms of community development type work, and also in terms of cultural competence and cultural security. Um, 
so those are the elements for leadership. Let's briefly look at some elements for integrated embed. I'm just going to have a, some water. Sorry about that. So integrating and embedding very rapidly because I'm seeing time flying already. Uh, two things I want to mention here that came out of the forum. So yes, we need to integrate a mental health lens, and this has to happen uh, at the various steps of public health programming, so, so, so through assessment and planning, implementation, and evaluation. But before we get to that step, it, it was identified as re being crucially important to actually recognize what is already being done, because a lot of this work is already occurring, and it's important to really systematically look at what's being done and link it to mental health promotion, to really clarify where the work is already available, what is being done, and to be able to identify what gaps are there, to then be able to add the mental health lens to, to, to fill the gaps. So very quickly here, I don't want to go through this, this graphic entirely, I just want to give you some pointers in terms of what it could mean. Um, so when you're thinking about integrating and analyzing gaps, you want to see if you have uh, men positive mental health indicators, uh, mental wellness indicators developed with, in, with indigenous uh, communities, uh, community well-being indicators. Are you reporting on um, protective and risk factors for mental health and their distribution in communities? Are you focusing on interventions in a socio-ecological perspective? Uh, you may have individual level interventions that are developed, but not necessarily su supported through the principles of the Ottawa Charter. Um, are you uh, focusing on social interactions uh, throughout the life course? Uh, are you focusing on the entire life course? And, and uh, are, are um, interventions considered holistically? Uh, in terms of mind-body connection. And finally, is the general overview uh, aiming for uh, the ability to really create uh, in communities hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose? So I'll skip that. And as I said, I won't be discussing partnership. Uh, this was a partnership slide uh, here in detail. Uh, I'll let you look at it um, after the webinar, but really the idea is, as I said, to establish the partnerships with the key actors, develop two-way communication. Um, I'll just say two words about why you have communities of practice and co-production. It came out ex as extremely important during the webinar uh, to really create occasions between public health actors to create communities of practice to really link the expertise, the emerging expertise in terms of implementation practices that are being developed in various settings, uh, and share the levers and share the implementation practices among public health actors. So really, this is maybe a new element of partnership, so partnering with the, with the key partners that we've identified, but, but also amongst public health actors and with researchers, because we're really here in a dimension of co-production uh, of knowledge and really uh, linked to contexts and practices, so there is a need to contribute to ongoing co-production and exchange of knowledge in this area. So I'll end with this, just to suggest again um, that we are within known a uh, known area of public health. These are known roles with specificity added to them, uh, but we are really building on the expertise of public health. Uh, the specificity is really about trying to integrate perspectives which will, in the end, create uh, inclusion and belonging and uh, hope, belonging, meaning, and purpose. Um, essentially, we are going to need to develop a workforce which uh, uh, develops competency, yes, in terms of uh, literacy in mental health and wellness, but essentially relying on health promotion, knowledge, skills, value, and ethical base, uh, but also in terms of cultural safety and competence. And we've seen that we need to have supportive structures uh, as well as supportive research and science because we are really in an area where we're talking about um, inclusive uh, structures, collaborative structures, uh, co-production of knowledge and also mobilizing for this work plural sources of, of knowledge. Um, and so this is the, the area we're, we're in when it comes to integrating mental health and wellness promotion in, in public health. Um, so with this, I, I, um, I would like to 
um, I'll pause. I, I'm, I, we, we had uh, identified we may answer one or two questions now, um, but we can, I think, go to the next presentation. And if you have comments or questions that come up once this uh, processes a bit, uh, you can identify them in the, in the box and we'll answer all of the questions at the end together because some things may overlap as well with the next presentation. Uh, so here I am really happy again to skip those. You'll be able to look at those uh, later on. Uh, really happy to be able to present uh, Shana Kalix and uh, Dr. Penny Sutcliffe who will be uh, explaining the processes they've identified uh, to integrate a public mental health perspective into their work uh, in Sudbury. Thank you. And uh, uh, here's to you, Shana and Penny. <laughs> Merci, Pascal. Thank you. Can you hear us okay? Yes, we can hear you. No problem. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Penny Suffolk, and I'm uh, in the room uh, with uh, my colleague and manager, uh, mental health and addiction, Sheena Kalix, and we're very, very pleased to be here today. So thank you, Pascal, and the webinar organizers for creating this opportunity for us to share with you some comments from a local public health practice perspective. And certainly, uh, chef -O, hats off to uh, Sheena and her small but mighty team and to her director, Sandra LeClay, for all of their work in, uh, in getting us to this point. Uh, we really want to use this opportunity to describe our journey in really systematically mapping out the role for local public health uh, in the area of mental health. And we hope that both our journey and our destination, and so far anyway, are helpful to you as you chart your own course for the webinar participants, regardless of where you currently find yourselves in your journey. We also hope, uh, for sure, with the questions and discussion at the end, to learn from participants as we continue to build on the experience of others. Um, so a little bit about us, for the, for the, the, the minority who are not from uh, Ontario on the line, uh, there was a map of Ontario here, but we are part of the uh, formal public health uh, system in Ontario, so public health Sudbury and districts. We're one of 35 uh, local boards of health. We are governed by an autonomous or freestanding board of health comprised of municipal councillors and municipal and provincial appointees. And our service area is a mix of urban and rural areas with the city of Greater Sudbury being about a four-hour drive from Toronto or five hours from our largest or most distant office, uh, smallest office, our Chapel office, or about uh, 20 hours or so from uh, Winnipeg if there are any Manitobans on the line. All Ontario Boards of Health are responsible for the full range of public health programs and services from control of infectious diseases and environmental health protection to chronic disease prevention and health promotion. And of course, more laterally, we're responsible for mental health promotion mental illness prevention and early identification and referral. Uh, so like, yikes, that brings us uh, to, uh, to today. Um, so in Ontario, as many on the line will know, public health has a long-standing history of working to support mental health. This is despite not having a formal mandate in this area. And two surveys were conducted in 2013 and 2015, uh, led by a CAMH, the Center for Addictions and Mental Health, in partnership with combinations of the Ontario Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care, Public Health Ontario, and Toronto Public Health. And the resulting reports describe really the, the extensive work, the investments, and the issues that local boards of health uh, were having in promoting mental health for children, youth, and adults. It's certainly significant work. So as I mentioned, this work was done without a formal mandate. Uh, this was until the 2018 the release of the Ontario Public Health Standards uh, as they were published to include specific requirements for boards of health to undertake work in mental health. So locally, we wanted to seize this opportunity to really take advantage of it to examine closely what we were already doing, what we could tweak or leverage to do better, and what new things we could do, all in support of mental health uh, work, which of course results in the action framework that we're discussing today on this webinar. So the Public Health Library and District's Public Mental Health Action Framework is the result of our reflection and really systematic review of what this new formalized mandate means for our agency's local public health action in support of mental health. The framework, of course, is grounded in the Mental Health Promotion Guideline, Ontario's Mental Health Promotion Guideline of the Ontario Public Health Standards. And very importantly uh, for us at the local level, it's action-oriented and really provides a roadmap for comprehensive public health interventions. The framework states what you know, really is obvious, I'm sure to the participants on this webinar, that there is no health 
without mental health. So we're thinking that perhaps this is not so obvious for all of our publics or even certainly to all of our staff. So we wanted to create a document that made this point really very explicitly. We also very intentionally use the term public mental health. So we all kind of trip over that term a, a bit, and that's probably a, a good thing because it keeps us really mindful of the work that we're doing and the message that we want to convey. And there are probably three reasons why we purposely use the term public mental health. So first off, it makes it really explicit that our public health work must support mental health in addition to physical health, so stating that explicitly. Secondly, as defined by Public Health England, public mental health is a broader or umbrella term that incorporates mental health promotion, mental health, uh, mental illness and suicide prevention, and improving lives. So it really includes much more than just access to health care services and needs to be based on the same foundations of practice as other work in public health. Finally, the work of public health and supporting mental health cuts across all programs and disciplines in the local public health setting. We wanted everyone to understand that they have a role to play, be that our public health nurses, our public health inspectors, nutritionists, epidemiologists, health promoters, uh, and on and on in no matter what program area or foundational standard area that they work in. Creating a framework for action also allowed us to systematically assess what we're currently doing, what we could do better, and what we could do that's new. So many certainly have observed, and I think Pascal uh, referenced this also, that public mental health is not fundamentally different or distinct from public health overall. So really we were asking ourselves, does the emperor have any clothes? Uh, is this work simply renaming or repackaging what we're already doing? Or are there real areas for improvement and new interventions? And uh, through our work, we would say yes, actually, to all of those and the need to focus in all of those areas. The Ontario Mental Health Guidelines prescribe three roles for local public health. There's a recognition, uh, certainly, uh, that the greatest yield for our investments in terms of numbers of people impacted is in the upstream promotion work that we do, but also a recognition that public health has a role in prevention and in early identification and referral. Our public mental health framework incorporates the foundations of public health practice, so including population health assessment, health equity, and effective public health practices. Further, the framework addresses how local public health programming must embed mental health promotion strategies informed by situational assessments and using a proportional universalism approach. So when embedded in programming, mental health promotion approaches need to include all of those points that are um, noted by the asterisk on the slide, so health promotion, social determinants, risk and protective factors, focusing on reducing stigma, uh, embedding trauma awareness, focusing on strengths, and engaging with priority populations. The framework considers a life course perspective for programming, as well as the implementation of whole population and community-based interventions, particularly for those uh, cross-cutting issues. And finally, our ongoing engagement and collaboration with multiple sectors is essential for our comprehensive public mental health approach. This slide describes the commitments that are explicit in our framework. Okay, so really the commitments that we make to this work. It articulates uh, the five areas and commitments that we feel must inform what we do and how we do this work. So first off, mental health for all, being committed to the two continuum model where we're looking at supporting mental health for all regardless of mental illness diagnosis, for example. Uh, we're committed to the social determinants of mental health, and in particular, uh, teasing that out to focus on social inclusion, freedom from discrimination and violence, and access to economic resources. We're committed to shining a light on stigma and discrimination, making that a, a focal area. We are dedicated to privileging the voices of people with lived experience, including uh, families and carers of people with lived experience. And finally, we are really committed to informing our public mental health practice with the aspiration to build hope, belonging, and purpose to individuals and communities. So voila, here is a visual depiction of the uh, mental health action framework, uh, which is grounded in the guideline, is action-oriented, and provides the roadmap for interventions. It really does articulate our commitment to concepts and investments to improve mental health opportunities for all throughout the Sudbury District uh, catchment area. 
So at this point, I'll hand uh, this over to uh, my colleague, to Athena Kalix, who, as I mentioned, is a manager of mental health and addictions. And she's going to share some reflections and uh, um, sort of more concrete uh, for uh, uh, local public health action as it relates to this work. And I'll just pass the phone over. Great. Thank you very much, Penny. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So what does this actual mean, mean actually for the practice of local public health practitioners? The Public Mental Health Action Framework provides a roadmap for public mental health actions that builds on what we are currently doing. It helps us to systematically identify how we could do things differently and or maybe do very different things. And of course, all with the aim of fully leveraging public health actions for positive mental health outcomes. So this next slide shows the roadmap for public health actions or interventions organized under the three foundational standards and four required approaches for the program standards. The results of our work currently is, is, are these 18 areas of intervention. This slide is a summary of all 18. Specific actions, work plans, and related investments are the subject of more detailed work plans that are under development. Each area of intervention includes a summary, outcome description, indicators, and a categorization of whether the opportunity represents reinforcing our current work, reframing or reorienting our work, or new mental health work. I'm going to show a couple of examples, two from our foundational standards and two from our required approaches for program, just to give a bit more information about what we're thinking of. So this is an example exited from the area of intervention, foundational standards, effective public health practice, mental health literacy of public health practitioners. So with this intervention, we will support various mechanisms to increase public health workforce's use of a lens of practice that focuses on the four components of mental health literacy. This includes understanding how to obtain and maintain positive mental health, understanding mental health problems and forms of treatment, decreasing stigma related to mental health problems, and enhancing help-seeking efficacy. On this slide here, we have an example, um, the purposeful reporting on the social determinants of mental health. So here is some of the work that, of course, we know really well how to do. We will utilize surveillance data and analysis of mental health and the social determinants, which will be shared publicly and communicated with relevant audiences. The outcome we're hoping from this uh, intervention would be to surface the links between the social determinants of mental health in our reporting, which will contribute to public health program planning, delivery, and management that levels up opportunities for mental health for all in our communities. Another example, and this is from one of our programs, um, identify and implement public mental health initiatives that will address public health relevant levers to the social determinants of mental health. So in, in this intervention, we will focus on raising awareness of the social determinants of mental health with various stakeholders, including policymakers. This is work, of course, that public health is very good at doing, and we're hoping that by doing so, we will help implement, um, these initiatives will help implement to raise awareness of social determinants of mental health among community leaders and decision makers, and that community literacy of the social determinants of mental health will be increased, for instance, by supporting individuals to be securely housed. And one final example that I'll share is to consider interventions for school community and care communities, including families. With this intervention, we will look on work that will focus on whole school communities and carers to foster a more resilient and thriving community. Of course, this is an area that uh, we identify as work that we're already doing because broad-based interventions around mental health promotion, prevention, and early, early intervention or referrals can be implement implemented within the school community and also provided for carers, which will have for us a greater impact on the work we're already doing. So what are the next steps in terms of the work we're doing here at Public Health Sudbury and Districts? Of course, our Board of Health will be uh, an important player in providing the governance needed to make sure that that mandate is uh, emphasized and also open the way for us to make sure that our work that we're doing is supported by all in our, in our organization and specifically um, the leadership at the top. We will also need central leadership, and so there's an image at the bottom there of a spider web and a spider. So my work is uh, to be the spider, <laughs> uh, not to collect anybody to eat or anything like that, but to help people weave together this work so that we can really identify how we each play a role in uh, supporting mental health of our communities, but also implementing this in the work that we do. 
Um, it's important for us to understand that everyone owns this work. It's not only the, uh, the work of one division or one area or one team, but that we all want to engage in uh, exchanging knowledge around the work we do and how best we can implement it in all of the work that we do engage in. Uh, of course, we also want to own this mandate. We shared this presentation and our framework with a number of our community partners and let them know that this is the work that we are expecting to do. So as a result, we need to live up to that work and make sure that we deliver on some of our expectations that we've put up uh, or put out into our community. We will also have work plans with more detailed information as well as uh, resources and investments on, into this work so that we can make sure that we have the most impact as we continue to move this through um, our organization and into our community. So as we push our public health system forward and truly embed public mental health throughout our scope of practice, we require explicit, ambitious, and even radically different approaches to our work. I, for one, am very much looking forward to doing this work, and I look forward to hearing from all of you on your thoughts on how we move together as a public health system. If you'd like a copy of our public health mental health action, public mental health action framework, you can visit us on our website, www.phsd.ca. If you put mental health in the search, it will come up um, with, that, uh, with that page, and you'll see both in English and in French, we have copies of the framework available. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Shana and Penny. That was an extremely interesting presentation. And I think uh, so many of the, of the links between the two presentations are also, are also there. We, we see how, in practice, um, the leadership role, uh, in terms of really the advocacy role, in terms of um, bringing the conversation upstream and mobilizing various partners around this comes up very strongly in your in your activities. Uh, and I found very interesting as well your uh, perspective of the spider, which is really uh, a, a, an interesting uh, an interesting dimension to identify in terms of the role of uh, doing the work to mobilize and also creating a form of accountability in doing the work, which is extremely interesting. Um, there is a conversation happening in the chat box uh, already. Uh, a lot of this conversation, uh, some of this conversation has been on the term, on, on the terminology uh, used um, when it comes to uh, lived experience. So Diane Oikel was suggesting that uh, there's some language shift to the term uh, moving from lived experience to grounded expertise. Um, she mentions it's a term that seems to carry a bit more strength as a legitimate source of knowledge. Uh, there were some discussions around that, um, um, asking where the term had been identified, which practitioners and communities this, this uh, came out of, uh, also mentioning that uh, grounded expertise, um, wondering if grounded expertise really captures lived experience, uh, and as it may actually capture I'm understanding perhaps lay knowledge, but not necessarily grounded or lived experience. So um, conversations about that occurring. I don't know if you have, um, if you if you've uh, identified such issues in practice uh, in Sudbury, uh, questioning the term of lived experience versus uh, versus um, um, grounded I'm grounded sorry, expertise. Sorry. Yes. Have you, have you encountered those issues in practice? No, I haven't actually. This is new. This is Shana speaking. This is new knowledge to me. I um, before I came to public health, I was working as a executive director of a peer-run organization here in Sudbury, um, and we've gone through a number of different changes in terms of uh, language that we use to identify our personal experience. Myself having lived experience of, uh, of mental health challenges. Um, so you know, we've gone from consumer to um, per, you know person with lived experience, and so this grounded expertise. It makes me think about the fact that. You know, when we think about we are grounded in our own experience, for me it pulls into the idea that you must locate yourself, socially locate yourself. And I saw that it, was, it came from an Indigenous speaker, um, which, you know, I've always found that that has been very important to identify which community you're from, what, um, what, uh, what speaks to your perspective. Uh, myself, personally, as a, a black queer woman, you know, always making sure to centralize myself in my own personal experience. So when I hear grounded expertise, that's what it brings me brings to mind. I haven't heard that used, but uh, definitely will consider it for future and perhaps see what my colleagues think in terms of that, that language. 
Thank you, Sheena. That's a very interesting, interesting perspective. I, uh, I hadn't heard of the term either. Uh, I, I would tend to also uh, um, agree in terms of my, my knowledge of the, of the terms, really. And specifically, when we, we hear of, when we understand what's necessary for this type of work, uh, and, and really the multiple forms of knowledge that are necessary, the multi, not multidisciplinary and multi, multiple sources and forms of knowledge in terms of, yes, grounded expertise, indigenous expertise, lay forms of knowledge, uh, uh, lived experience forms of knowledge. So they're all, uh, they all need to be uh, mobilized and integrated in terms of creating uh, interventions that are really uh, community anchored and culturally anchored. Um, so I think that's an interesting conversation to continue, and Diane has suggested that we can reach out to her if we for, for further information about the, the, the specific terminology. Um, so I see a question um, from from Peel Public Health. Have you developed or do you expect new partnerships uh, from non-traditional public health partners to support this work? Um, so um, I think this is probably more uh, aiming for you, for you in February in terms of the, the, uh, the, the implementation in practice. Um, Penny, I can start off. I think that I think that our uh, the humility, I guess, that we would bring to this work so far um, has really uh, been instrumental in our developing um, partnerships engagement with, uh, with sectors, with others with whom we might not traditionally work or, or work at the level that we have been working. Um, so I think that we've, uh, we've sort of, we sort of, a little story, we sort of humbly brought together uh, a bunch of different sectors, some um, we invited uh, people to come together from sectors who, you know, formally historically have had a mandate and work in mental health and mental illness explicitly, other partners that we work with uh, in public health. So, uh, could the education, municipality, et cetera, and um, use the new mandate as an opportunity to say, this is new for us explicitly as, a, as, as an explicit mandate. Um, many of you have been working in this area before. Help us understand what it is that we could do, where are the gaps that we could uh, uh, try to uh, figure out how we might fit into that to support mental health. And so the process, I think, was really effective because we certainly didn't go in saying for public health and we know what we want to do as it relates to mental health, but really seeking the, uh, the explicit partnerships uh, and support from others for whom this has been the middle of their desk uh, to help us understand what we should be doing. So there are many partners, uh, many players and actors that perhaps we've engaged with in some ways before, but not on this issue and not in such a uh, robust or, or, or multi-sectoral way. And so that has actually led to the establishment of a, a local committee that is a systems priority action table, uh, wherein we're one of the key players. It's all about action. It could be about low-hanging fruit, but really about uh, how do we get some traction on um, the many, many, many issues in our community from upstream to downstream uh, that uh, need to be addressed as it relates to uh, supporting mental health. Mm -hmm. And you know what I've noticed is someone who actually moved from working quite downstream in the system and actually was employed at one of the one of the agencies there that's at the table to now moving to work here at public health is that we've really had an effect on the way in which our partners think about the whole spectrum of mental health for all. And so we have our partners really talking about upstream ways to support mental health. Um, which can then have an effect, of course, as we know, um, on the downstream. So we've now been able to prioritize a very upstream um, uh, priority or, or engagement and have uh, quite a good buy-in from a number of our partners around doing that work. So that's been great. Um, thank you, Shana. Thank you, Penny. I think those are uh, very important comments. And I, I'd like to, to add to that, or I don't know how to reiter reiterate some, some elements of that as well in terms of what we're seeing in in theory, the idea being that, um, um, uh, you know, I had identified the need for a common vision and common language uh, really across sectors, or at least a shared shared vision and, and shared language, uh, which is really to identify that uh, many actors uh, from various sectors who, 
really uh, have impact and, and, and strong levers when it comes to in influencing mental health may not see themselves as pertinent um, actors within this area uh, because when we talk about mental health, there is this tendency still today to, to refer to mental illness. And so they may find their, themselves not necessarily associated to the objectives of mental health promotion. So there is a need really to, for public health to um, be able to, uh, to be fluent in the many languages of mental health that are appropriate in, in different sectors to really uh, mobilize the various sectors who may not feel that they, they have um, connection to the, to the work. Um, so that could be t speaking about social and emotional learning in schools. That could be speaking about work productivity in work environments. That could be speaking about inclusion uh, and, and, uh, and uh, social connections with municipal actors. Uh, but really, uh, that is the idea in terms of bringing the key actors to the table and, 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 and talking the, the language of mental health that resonates for various actors that need to, 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 to be part of the conversation. Um, um, so Hi, Pascal. Yeah. Sorry, we see a question there about um, from KFLA. Public health about the commitment to um, forwarding or privileging the voices of people's lived experience or grounded expertise, as we've learned today. May I uh, carry on with that response? Yes, I should. absolutely. Um, because I'm very excited to talk a little bit about that. So one of the um, one of the things that we have uh, started up here, and uh, it was influenced by some work happening at uh, CAMH in Toronto, was to form an empowerment council. Uh, what we found that a number of uh, of committees, planning tables, we're looking for people with lived experience to uh, provide their advice or support um, on the number of initiatives that are happening across our community. And so what we've decided to do is uh, we're going to pilot it uh, at first, um, but we're going to bring together a number of people who have various lived experiences or grounded expertise um, into an empowerment council, and uh, they will be the ones who will prov provide that advice and support um, to the work that we're doing so that we can make sure that their voices are prominently featured or part of the conversation that we're having. Uh, we know that just including one or two people sometimes isn't, isn't as meaningful as it can be, but when people are together in a group and feel supported and feel validated, um, you don't have to necessarily explain themselves in a larger context, um, but you know, great things can come, great strategies can come out of those councils, and we see, we've seen them happen across our country. So we're very excited about that piece of work. And I wonder if there may be something that once that's finalized, we just put on our website that might, could be of use to others to adapt for your own use if this is an area of interest. Yes, for sure. Thank you, thank you, Shana. Um, I see another question that's really um, relevant for, for, for your context as well. So maybe you would like to answer the one from North Bay Perry Sun District Health Unit. Um, for local public health, will this framework be discussed or integrated into local planning tables developed as part of the lead agency tables, moving on mental health? Can you hear us? No. Yes. Oh, well, now we can. I don't know if you were trying to answer. Um, oh, no. Can you, can you hear us now? Yes. OK, sorry. <laughs> Too many buttons. Um, I think that's an excellent question. And, and she and I were both looking at each other saying, we're, we, we don't know. But I think it's an excellent question. And maybe it's more of a, um, uh, a spark for us to, uh, to look at how that might be used. Certainly, we have, uh, it's, it's relatively hot off the press, but we have been um, sharing the framework because what we're hopeful is that not only does it describe to external players or actors what the work is of public health, but perhaps um, others can see themselves in it too and how, how they might sort of, you know, use it to leverage the, the work that they can do. So a really good question. I think we need to use a bit more explicit like, work in that area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, I'm seeing um, Jessica from Toronto Public Health who's typing. Um, so we may have time for one last. <laughs> a lot of people seem to be typing. We we have time for maybe one or two last questions. So I'm waiting for the, um, the questions to appear. Um, oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here. <laughs> 
I'm going to wait if there's one more question, and if not, we're just going to uh, um, just waiting to see what appears for the next. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's it's now three o'clock, so uh, um, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, I really want to thank you, uh, Shana and Penny, for sharing. Uh, what you're doing in, in, in terms of integrating a public mental health perspective. Uh, so important to be able to share the knowledge between public health uh, practices. This is a key area of knowledge development and exchange in, in, in for this work. So thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for, for taking the time to be here this Friday afternoon. Go ahead, Milan. I'm not understanding. <laughs> OK. Oh, well, we're just going to advance the slide. Uh, until the end of the, here you go. So thank you very much. Oh, there's, thank you very much for all, for being here. And you will have access to the slides, of course, as we mentioned earlier, um, on the website of the NTCHPP as well as on the PHPC website. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>